So, no <laughs> <effort>. <laughs> I read your book last night and uh, the past two days when I was sick with the stomach flu. So it was a really memorable experience for <laughs> a number of reasons. And um, I love the word onlyness. And so I thought we could start by um, you telling us um, how you came to this word mm -hmm. and why you think that this word was the one that you wanted to hang this um, theology around. Each of us stands in a spot in the world only you stand in. It's a function of your history and experience, visions and hopes. Uh, it's the way we all create value. And the way I was coining the term, though, and it was around 2011, 2012, and I was trying to point out how much innovation was changing. It was going to um, ideas. The economy was really being fueled by ideas and moving away from having an organizational demand or needing capital. And so I was like, well, I couldn't find a word. Like, for example, like words I was using to try to describe this economic shift were things like talent. Mm -hmm. And I found when we use talent, we're quite often saying uh, someone is talented because they worked at the right company. Someone is talented because they have the right degrees. And I was actually saying something much broader, much different than that in this idea, which is that each and every single one of us, maybe even 7.5 billion of us, have the capacity to add value in this economy. The fact that we don't yet is our greatest problem and also our greatest opportunity. So I was trying to figure out how to coin that. So onlyness was this idea that in a distributed networked world, ideas finally had a shot. Mm -hmm. That for thousands of years, most ideas have not had a shot. Mm -hmm. uh, if it came in certain packaging, if you were especially young or especially old uh, in any designation, right? Um, or if you didn't look at the role of a traditional power player, uh, it could easily be um, you know, the idea itself could just be dismissed based on who brought the idea. And so if I, I was basically trying to find a way to coin that term. So it's totally an economic term, and in fact, uh, I wrote it in the context of a business book that Harvard published, and then I was like, done. I thought that was good, you know, clarifying the entire universe in that thing. And then it <laughs> turns out not really clarifying because how do you operate mm -hmm. in this new world? And that's what led me to pull on this thread and, and mm -hmm. explore actual stories of people doing it. It's interesting that you put it that way because um, so many people now say, you know, tell your story, tell your story, particularly to women. It's like, tell your story or somebody will tell your story for you. And mm -hmm. you had the expression in the book, um, code or be coded, yeah. which um, to me is kind of like the similar line. But nobody really tells us um, how to tell our stories or what it really means to tell our stories like within this kind of context. Um, was there a moment for you when um, you felt that you yourself were like the embodiment of, of this issue with like, getting your ideas heard. So I know you mentioned in the book that uh, you had an issue with a, a mentor who didn't quite get it. Yeah. And, uh, and um, told you that you had to be edgier. Right, so uh, the, the, I had turned, in fact, in naming that second book, um, I had turned to someone who had many best-selling management books and really pithy titles and such and said, um, you know, would you mind helping, because you seem really good at it, would you mind kind of helping me brainstorm um, how to frame this question? And I'd sent him some content, he said, of course, and, uh, and we met at the end of a workshop day and um, everyone else had left and he says, as a brown woman, the chances of your ideas being seen in the world are next to nothing. For you to be seen, your ideas would have to be a lot edgier but if you were edgy, that group of people that you're trying to influence would find you too controversial. And so, and I remember just because there was this long pause, and I'm like, please turn the direction of this question, right? Um, <laughs> long pause, and to repeat, that, so your ideas will never be heard in the world. And uh, I remember because right afterwards, I ended up going to, you know, there was like some dinner, and people were meeting up for drinks and stuff. And I went to them, and I repeated the exact line of what he had just said. And what I got were, size and mm, gosh yeah mm. and and no like no one said which I, by the way if someone ever repeats this to you what i hope somebody would have said to me now is something to the effect of and using inappropriate language completely but um that's entire bullshit yeah. um and it took uh three months of me uh living with that and internalizing what he believed to be true mm -hmm. as a truth mm -hmm. or even the truth mm -hmm and thinking, well, maybe he's just trying to help me, mm -hmm. right? 
And, um, and actually what he was doing um, was repeating how power works. So power works where we keep looking to the same people for the set of ideas. And, and then that reinforces the loop of ideas can only come from that one and only place. Um, and it looks more like uh, traditional white, male, rich. You know, so in my management world, I'm pointing out they're mostly Harvard educated or Ivy League educated, um, mostly white, mostly male, uh, mostly heterosexual. Right? There's a profile of what that looks like in almost every dimension other than the sexuality dimension. I do not fit that profile. <laughs> you know, I'm younger by 20 years uh, and so on. I, I went through community college and all these other forms of education. And so um, it was such an interesting thing to be writing about onlyness because that's where I first introduced the idea, mm -hmm. and have someone say, you're not allowed mm -hmm. to have an original idea unless mm -hmm. you fit some certain packaging. And so it's been a, I don't know what the right word is, but sort of like this meta challenge um, to actually show um, that ideas can and should come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then to show, uh, at least in the book, 20 stories, but I actually researched 300 to mm -hmm. get to those 20 stories, how do effectively powerless mm -hmm. people, by society standards, still manage to do really powerful things. Right. Yeah. It's like that phrase, um, you know, take back your power. And um, people would say that to me when I was at like a dark time in my life. It's like, you know, you have to take back your power. And, and um, I find that interesting because like that always assumes that the power is like completely within the individual. And it, it overlooks the fact that power is often embedded in relationships and structures around the individual. And we all have to like fit within that system and play within that system. Or if we're going to rebel against that system, we have to figure out how to do it in a way that actually accomplishes something, like to rebel and then to lead. This is a really deep insight, Justine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> really is. No, so, so power is a social construct. You cannot define it independently of the social construct. Um, uh, so so how, um, how we conceive of ourselves is not isolated. That's why if five of your friends uh, you know, tell you one thing about you, your closest people, you will start to become and adopt that set of ideas. There's all sorts of research around the social science. So agency has to start with certainly your own conception of how you create value in the world, but also how you have other people help you manifest that value. So I always say it's first about how you hold yourself, mm -hmm. and second, as you are valued. Right? So mm -hmm. first, how you value yourself, and second, how you're valued. But those are two are a, a dance, an interlinking, Piece. Mm -hmm. so, so it's why we conform, yes. right? So when we show up, if we're um, onlys, uh, uh, the data says that if we're less than 15% of a group, uh, we will almost always conform to the majority of that group. Uh, so we will, we, as, you could lean in as much as you want to, but if you're in a group full of people that has a dominant narrative that is different than yours, you will not be able to affect change in that group. That's why onlys don't affect change. That's why we've celebrated for hundreds of years when someone is a first, and we say, oh, they're the first one who became such and such, or you know, the only one who's, they rarely ever actually change the status quo because they live within a system. So uh, the, the threshold turns out to be, the research says about 30% of difference mm -hmm. in a room starts to create an entire structure where people are allowed to have original ideas, mm -hmm. right? So that's why social, the social construct is so important. Mm -hmm. Because there's a, we require that sense of solidarity. So like, it's almost like we need that alternative um, sense of how to be. And that uh, um, he talked about signaling in this book. Mm -hmm. And that um, in order to really find your people, you have to um, signal who you are. You have to like, send out these signs. And um, so it comes back to this idea that you have to um, not only like, be who you are, you have to show who you are. And, and yet that also kind of like, like, you know, if, if this was a jungle and you're signaling who you are and you're calling out to your tribe, you're also going to, like, pull in the predators. So it's a, it's a very risky position to take. It is. But, um, I forgot what I was going to say. But, um, don't we explore that in the story that we actually did in the book? That would be great. Yeah. So, um, so one of the, in fact, how I ended up coming to find the story was, uh, there was, I'm trying to think of the woman's name now. Uh, Penelope Trunk. Trunk. Yeah. Oh my gosh, wrote this article that said uh, women should not be CEOs um, because they wanted to be mothers. Because they want to be mothers. Because yeah. you can't be both. Can't be both. Right. Exactly. And uh, she's an ink columnist, and uh, this piece got published, I want to say, in TechCrunch at the time. Mm. And I was just horrified at 
I mean, like the premise. First of all, a singular story, her individual story, is now being you know applied to 53% of the population, as if somehow her truth is the truth, right? So interesting um, parallel to that. And uh, and I'm just sitting there going, oh my god, that is not what the story says. Like if you read the details, it was a failure of leadership of her inability to actually build a team around her. And I had just finished shutting down the company I had been leading. Uh, where I had faced a really similar situation, entirely due to personal circumstances, I was faced with the tension of company or personal stuff, and uh, the business was doing fine. I was really happy. My whole identity was really tied with that company, and uh, and yet this personal situation really demanded my attention. And so I had asked the team to take over. I had some really senior people. One guy was a former VP at Palm. One guy was a, you know so really senior people um, who worked for me, and I said just hold the keys. There's enough money in the bank. Take over. I will not judge you. Go. And I really need to go do this other thing. And uh, they all, three senior people, vetoed and said, no, I won't pick up the keys. And it turns out later, years later, they all said, well, we had hoped that you wouldn't leave. And this was our strategy for that. And I was like, you guys are assholes. <laughs> but um, uh, <laughs> I didn't mention that at the time. Anyway. Um, uh, such inappropriate language on my part. Um, but uh, uh, I ended up shutting down the company uh, really fast in order to kind of deal with my own um, personal situation. And that was not a failure of me being a child, you know, having a child mm -hmm. and being a mother and, and being a CEO and so on. It was that I had not built a leadership mm -hmm. team behind me that was ready to take over, right? It was mm -hmm. purely a management problem. Mm -hmm. And I had not. I planned on leaving, so I had not done the right um, uh, sort of succession planning. And yet, so, so the reason I'm sorry, that was a long story. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I end up writing a post about it. And so it was Saturday morning. I see her piece. I write a piece on it. And um, this woman ends up reaching out, who's an entrepreneur um, originally from Canada, who says, I've been following this dialogue online. I really thought your piece was instructive. This is Rachel Sklar. Rachel Sklar. Rachel Sklar. Who ends up writing me the story. We end up forming a 500 person, what's called the list, of women trying to change the ratio of women on boards, getting funded, et cetera. If I hadn't written that little signal in the sky, and she hadn't been seeking who else is interested in this topic, we would not have found each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so at the time, what it looks like is I'm sitting in my pajamas. I could just as easily have been like, whatever, this, this article's cray, and ignored it, right? But what I was saying is, no, actually, I think it's wrong, and it's a wrong premise for it to be out there like this without some more challenging. So you know, I want to at least address that question. It gave me a chance to process. And it caused a whole series of other community things to happen. And so the predator point, though, is really interesting. And Rachel, actually, as the champion of the list, is then trying to change how Silicon Valley works and how funding works and stuff. And she's really challenging Silicon Valley. And at one point, Michael Arrington and uh, Sarah Lacey and a bunch of other people invite her to a conference with the premise that they want to listen to her. And they, if you find the video, and it's, it's footnoted in the book, um, they just attack the hell out of her for like 45 minutes and basically say, you're a, what was the word, interloper. You're an interloper in our environment and dissed on her. For, can you imagine being on a stage with like a couple thousand people following you, getting dissed? And, uh, and I tell the story, and in fact, one of my friends who had read the early draft of the book said, this story scares the heck out of me. You know, like why would anyone ever want to raise their hand and be a change agent if you're going to get attacked? And so I added this one little paragraph of, this is not meant to scare you. <laughs> but to warn you that this could happen, because any time you're creating change, you're challenging the status, status quo, mm -hmm. which means, by the way, every person in the status quo mm -hmm. will not actually appreciate that, right? Because mm -hmm. their world is going to be dented. Right. Yeah. Why do you think they are so threatened by quote unquote interlopers? Like, I find it interesting that they would um, use the word interloper as like this insult, as a way to shut her down, when really all it means is that, well, you know, you're, you're a stranger and you've wandered into our mist. Yeah. So like, you know, they could have just said, well, sit down, have a cup of coffee and tell us your ideas and tell us what you see from the outside. But there was like, but the, the um, reaction instead is to, to cut her out of the picture, or at least to try to. And so power preserves power. Yeah. Right. So um, all the um, research around gender stuff that talks about power uh, I'm sorry, all the stuff that says, you know, like, 
uh, how women affect change mm -hmm. really l makes it look like a gender issue. It's not. Mm -hmm. All issues are about power issues. Who is allowed to have an idea at the table? Because power either um, liberates your ideas at the table, because mm -hmm. they're heard, or they limit. And so your own power of what you have going into that room determines quite often whether or not that room even hears you, right? right. And so, of course, she had no power, right. according to the power mongers, the VCs, the journalists, et cetera, who, by the way, this is their turf. Yeah. And you're walking into my turf. Why would I want you to walk into my turf? And by the way, what you're doing is calling us out on the fact that less than 4% of all the money goes to women and people of color, mm -hmm. which is limiting the set of ideas that we're producing in mm -hmm. our economy, which is limiting the kinds of solutions we have. Rachel's basically busting them mm -hmm. on being myopic. And these are people who, by the way, pride themselves on changing the world, <laughs> Yes. right? So meritocracy. Meritocracy. So they believe a series of things that are not true, and that's that's, how, and so any of us who are going to be change agents, it's a really useful thing to realize that's the headwind that we're going to have to face, is recognize we're going right into that headwind. It's kind of like that video, and you referenced this in the book. Um, I think it was David Sivers, um, the one about the, uh, he did this very short TED Talk, and he shows this video of um, a man dancing by himself Second on dancer. a hill. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. Second he's dancing on the hill, on the hillside, I guess, at, at, a, at a concert, and all these people are around, and they're sitting, and he's like, you know, boogie woogieing, and you know, he kind of looks a little freakish. A little cray. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you know, he's totally into it. And he's willing to put himself out there and to look like that. And then a guy gets up and he joins him. And, and the then... two actually get into concert together. This That's is right. incredibly important. In yeah. And they, so the, the first one changes his dance style right. in order to get in groove with the second one. And right. the second one now starts, they're now starting to act in concert. Right. And then a flood of new people start to come, who, by the way, had been watching for a really right. long time. Um, the second person is the one that makes it safe enough um, because now you can see what the pattern is that you can join into, right? And so it's not just the, I mean, the, the first person who gets up and is willing to put himself out there and he's willing to kind of make himself a target, but it's also the second person too. Like that, it, it takes courage for that um, first follower. Right, so this is where onlyness is not about only, right? Yeah. So onlyness, it, it's, we're not adding nuz to only and saying more of you because that guy dancing at first that crazy dancer guy, um, we're not saying dance harder. That's not what this is. This well, is a, I'm saying dance harder, <laughs> but you might not be saying dance harder, so. we're, we're adding the second dancer and saying, how do you start a movement? Um, because that second dancer is now changing the first dancer's style so that they're now in unity about what's the dance we're trying to do. You see where the parallel holes, right? And then a whole bunch of other people can come and join in to make that a movement. So this is where only Nez mm -hmm. is about how do you come together around shared ideas, mm -hmm. ideas being the new organizing principle. So the organizing principle of all value creation for now hundreds of years has been this. Money, organization systems, it's not been about the ideas. That hasn't been the ball that we've been running down the field. So if we think about it, this is the, this is the tectonic opportunity that disruptors now have, which is how do you come mm -hmm. organize around ideas? So are you passionate about ideas? Then join mm -hmm. in. You don't have to work for me right. to make that a reality. You don't even have to know who I am. Exactly, yeah. right. So you start to create a lot of different kind of organizational systems, which mm -hmm. is what that second book was, that I wrote about was trying to get to, is the perimeter of how you actually create value has shifted. So mm -hmm. it used to be you all worked for me. And then you know that was the way it, You do that really well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and now we can actually say, OK, so I, if ideas can come from anywhere. So uh, 10 years ago, mobile companies used to decide what was on deck. That was the language that we used to use. And uh, choose one or two or three apps that used to be picked. One to two million dollars in development, one to two million dollars in sales cost, and then the company choosing. Today, 10 years later, we're now marketplace of ideas. Those ideas can come from anywhere around the world. The cost of development when Apple made the big shift went from a million dollars minimum to ten thousand dollars. That's what they did with their app kit. It went to five hundred by the time Google took it, uh, you know, to market. So now you're saying anyone can contribute to this marketplace of ideas. And I like the Apple example because they truly have created a marketplace where they make money, but so do the vendors, so the, who, all the players in the system. Unlike some other marketplaces where uh, people, there's not a viability to it, uh, which is why I think the Apple marketplace is so viable and so strong. Um, and then, and then the companies no longer have to decide everything, um, but consumers get a lot more choice. So you can see the, the ways in which all those ideas start to show up, but mm -hmm. it's because we have the marketplace of ideas enabled. So I think there's two 
things that we can do in terms of future of work there. Mm -hmm. One is how do you let anyone come and help you carry that ball down the field? Mm -hmm. Anyone. And then, which is really kind of a crazy idea, right? People from all around the world could help you do that. It is a really wild idea. And then, um, and then how do you actually uh, uh, organize in such a way that you don't have to hold it like this? This is how, you know, the competitive constructs of business strategy for a long time is competitive. It's my baby. And I'm saying it's collaborative, right? So hold the idea in such a way that anyone can come build around that idea and you build something much stronger for Or build it. on that idea. Build on right, that idea. Yeah. And so because the more ideas you get together, you can like deconstruct those ideas and make, you know, babies out of those ideas that grow into something completely different. Well, you know, you think about like the energy field or um, some of the, so the new emerging spaces of healthcare. It's not about one company trying to own, um, you know, how will energy operate in the future. Mm -hmm. It's I'm going to start building batteries that do, mm -hmm. you know, long range, allow us to have electric cars and all these other things. And then that set of things builds an entire ecosystem. You don't have to build the whole ecosystem too, right? So that's what companies used to have to do 30, 40 years ago. And now that's such a tectonic shift in terms of how we conceive of our role in the world. Mm -hmm. But it's not brand. It's not like me saying, I'm telling my story better. <laughs> it's me saying what it is I care about. Am I going to get up and dance with that partner? Mm -hmm. What's the dance I want to join? Right? So it changes the, the way we, we get up from the table, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's not just like I'm going to tell my story. It's like I'm going to embody the story. I'm going to be the story. And what I like about that um, example with the guy dancing on the video is that he's not like, he's not like handing out um, you know, bookmarks or postcards, or he's not like saying, come, come, dance with me. He's just he's up there and he's doing his thing. And he's so magnetic and uh, compelling that people decide that they want to go and they want to be part of what he's doing. And, well, and, and so all the stories of the book start out this way, through yeah. this process of really small, what looks like a micro action even. Um, so just one, just to share, there's so many, uh, but I'll share one. So Kimberly Bryant uh, had gotten a degree in engineering from Vanderbilt, shows up at her second job at DuPont, and gets introduced by her manager to her new team. And Kimberly was so excited. She just really loved being an engineer, loved building stuff, and so excited to join DuPont. And she gets introduced to her new team as this. With Kimberly Bryant, we got a twofer. Because Kimberly Bryant happens to be a black woman in tech. He was pointing out her otherness, not her onlyness. And of course, right in that minute, minute made her the only one at that table, right? Pointed out all the difference. So fast forward 15 years, and Kimberly's daughter, Kai, is going to Stanford Coding Camp and uh, is a really good gamer, super good at it, and gets treated as if she's a novice. And so she realizes you know, all the constructs that she had to face are going on into the next generation. Nothing's changed whatsoever. And so uh, after some thought, she gathers up old computers, literally borrows, like, you know, use things, builds some curriculum, gathers Kai and so, some of her friends around a kitchen table. These kids are like seven, eight, nine around a kitchen table and just teaches them to code. And then soon other kids are saying, hey, can I join in on that Saturday morning session? And then other moms are saying, can I borrow that curriculum and do it in a different city? And it grows. And um, it wouldn't have happened if the first action of hers was to say, yeah, that just really sucks. You know, and those people, oh, that's awful. Something, somebody's got to do something about that. Right? She did this. And today, she's, by the way, the program she started is called Black Girls Code. And one of the most fascinating things to me when she was telling me the story of uh, in naming the program, she was really challenged. She said um, she was you know, at some entrepreneur event and was talking to another colleague about what to name it. It had been about two years. And it was really starting to look legit, and things were starting to shape up. And, uh, and the entrepreneur turned to her and said, well, if what you're doing is teaching black girls to code, maybe call it that, you know, black girls code. But of course, the dilemma <laughs> that Kimberly was facing, and, and, and we can all empathize with her, is black in American society has not always been celebrated as equally strong. And so her assertion to find meaning in that story, to find value in that story, despite maybe what somebody else has said is marginal or somebody else has said isn't important, to reclaim that and act on it and assert one's own value in a narrative is an incredibly revolutionary idea. Um, for some people, by the way, incredibly normative. So when, sometimes I talk to certain groups of people, uh, they kind of look at me like I'm sort of like asserting the most obvious thing possible. And, uh, and then, but for other groups of people, they're like, yes, that, right? And so I'm, I'm just, I'm pointing out it is both revolutionary and normal, and it should just be normal for all of us, right? That we could assert that worth. So she goes off, it's now trained 10,000 girls already. 
And it wouldn't have happened if she hadn't started that little, like, let's just fix it. And it, she's not trying to own, where does it play out 10 years from now? That's not what she was trying to do. And none of the stories started out that way. Right. And I think that's the part of the story most people don't get to hear, right. is usually for one, two, three, four years of a window, it's just gestation. You don't even know what it is yet. Because you're, uh, so I ended up talking to a professor who teaches at London Business School whose expertise is on identity. And I was telling her that this was the pattern I was seeing in the story. She says, oh, this makes complete sense. It's like you're building out a new space of a house, that, like a wing of a house that you're going to move into. And so from your own identity perspective, you're expanding who you are. And so first you need to frame that space, maybe put up some drywall, maybe decide if it's safe to go in there. And as you're building it out, that scaffolding and so on is what you're actually doing is exploring whether or not that's a space you want to be in, right? Whether or not it holds you in a certain way. And I think that's a kind of a nice way of kind of thinking about it is that, but it will look, by the way, it will look messy and dusty and all the things that you would imagine in a home construction project, uh, you can imagine as your own identity. It is not exactly a neat, completed mm. space at the beginning. And yet we mostly tell the narrative from the time of nice, completed, the remodel's done space. And uh, so I thought it was really useful and instructive to kind of go back into everyone's history and kind of picture all the dust that it was going around. And the nails on the pavement that you drive over and then exactly. you puncture your tire and you have, not that that ever happened to me several times. But, um, <laughs> I like Kimberly Bryant's story and I think she has one of my favorite quotes in the book where she talks about how um, Martin Luther King Jr. taught her that uh, there are some things worth dying for and that this was what gave her the courage or, or the impetus to go forward and, and start this journey with like very little steps that lead into this you know, massive change that's uh, you know, in progress. And um, I was thinking that, uh, that's, that part of onlyness seems to be is, is, is rooted in that kind of meaning. Like part of your onlyness is figuring out, I mean, Joseph Campbell has this question where he says, um, I'm trying to, if you lost everything, what would you still believe in? And so part of uh, figuring out, I think, your story or your onlyness is, is knowing what you are willing to um, put yourself out there for, what you are willing to risk, you know, what's going to get you out dancing on the hillside and, uh, you know, raising this, this um, like, building that the neighbors will probably complain about. <laughs> and um, so, and to me, that's, that's where onlyness kind of gets almost, um, you know, spiritual or, or soulful. Like when I first saw this book and I first started reading this book, I was like, oh, it's about soul. And then meanwhile, a friend of mine saw it and she said, oh, it's about branding. And then uh, you actually make a distinction in that book between branding and the gift. And to me, the gift is, is that kind of like soulful quality that um, is, is like our creative DNA. You know, it's, it's like, uh, um, it's what we bring into a room that nobody else does, even if we're not always aware Can of it. Can you share the light bulb analogy? Oh, <laughs> so. Um, so can I tell a story? Uh, so sure. uh, Justine and I have known each other for several years, and at one point I was sharing with her this idea when it was still relatively early information. And, uh, and then she wrote about it, and she had this light bulb analogy that I now use all the time. And, is, and, and I, I quote you as the person who inspired it. And, uh, but, but please, tell the story. I want you to tell your take on the light bulb. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure where I got it. I was, um, it's this idea that, it was after that workshop we were in, right? Yeah. You walk into this room, and um, there's like a light bulb over your head that other people can see that you can't. And it, it's kind of like, uh, like light is very interesting to me because um, I mean, I was a literature major, and so light is always like symbolic of, of intellect, of thought, of spirituality, or soul, or that kind of thing. And so it's, or you know, like your aura, and other people can see it. And um, but you just assume that everybody is is the way that you are and everybody perceives the world the way that you do. You don't think to kind of question the things that come so easily to you that you don't even recognize them as qualities. And uh, so it, it, it requires us to, actually, I, I did this, um, I was at a workshop with, I think it was Jenny Sauer Klein. I don't know if I got her name correct. And, uh, but she did something like this, where you had to, within the first five minutes of this workshop, you had to stand up in front of the entire group and they would just look at you and they would call out adjectives that they felt described you. And then uh, she would write down all these adjectives on like a, a poster board and you would take it home with you. And then, um, so I thought that was interesting. And then a few weeks later, I ran the same uh, exercise by two of my closest friends while we were having lunch um, somewhere in San Francisco. And um, so, uh, and they wrote down like a list of adjectives that you know, we thought about each other, including me. And when I looked at the list that they gave me about the adjectives that they thought described me, um, and these are two women who have like known me for over 10 years. And I was amazed at how similar this list was 
to the list that people um, complete strangers who, yeah. yeah would know me for all of five minutes yeah. you know had had um, like there were it, w it was the same um, you got the same feeling from both lists or the same sense of the kind of person that I am um, which wasn't necessarily uh, the sense that I had of the person that I was and there was like that little bit of a disconnect and so I think in that little space between who you think you are and who other people think you are mm -hmm. there's like a, a a really interesting, you know, friction that I think maybe, you know, like like inspires a lot of creativity. But that's where, th I think that's the story that I yeah, told you. Yeah, that's the light bulb of your head, right? Because when you go in the room, the whole room is in that shade of the light bulb. That's like right, you yeah. see it through that lens. So if you need help figuring out what is your light bulb over your head and that you always care about the same things, you know, friends can certainly be a reflection back. When you're in the room, the room's always mallard blue, right? Or uh, uh, turmeric orange because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and so that can be a useful reflection. I think this gap you're pointing to about your own internal sense of who you are um, versus what other people see is the difference between two forms of identity. Um, and in the book, I, I use Andrew Solomon's language to kind of draw this distinction, so I'll, I'll go back to it. Um, Andrew's a New Yorker writer, and he talked about, in his book called Far From the Tree, he talked about two identities. One is vertical identity, and one is horizontal identity. Vertical identity are all the things that you're born into. So your socioeconomic status, your gender, uh, color, language, uh, a whole series of things are given to you by the way you were born. Horizontal identity is the things you claim as your own. It's the things you care about. And I like to think about loneliness. When I first characterized it, I said, it is a function of your history and experience. You can see the crossover now. And visions and hopes. And I made it both, those things, because visions and hopes is what you imagine is possible in the world, but you cannot prove or show to anyone. If onlyness did not include that by its fundamental definition, then you were limited in what you could contribute to the world based only on what you could show someone else. But what if you imagine something else is possible? What if you have a dream, either for yourself or for the world, how would you hold that? So onlyness is the center, you know, centrifuge of your vision and exp your history and experience, as well as your visions and hopes. And it's that vision and hopes that, as you pull on that thread, pulls you into the future, right? Because all progress is born of new ideas. And so, if we never even give ourselves permission for something that, by the way, we can't prove or show, we never get to pull on that thing that lets us create the future. I like that you use the word imagination and imagine. And because uh, I don't think there's really, I'm not sure that as a culture that we give enough credit and value to imagination outside of you know the arts and creative writing and, and those things that are, are you or know, great inventors, right? Great, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. But it's like uh, it's um it's why we celebrate Steve Jobs. It's why we celebrate you know the the right. icons who are willing to go out and imagine a future that's different than what we see today. That's that's right. Because like uh, uh, I once read somewhere that the mind. Um, the mind isn't very good at envisioning a new future. What it does is that it takes the past and then it projects it into the future. And so we always think the future is going to be like the past, which is one reason why we tend to think that um, the future is not going to be much different from what we're living right now. Like, you know, this moment is kind of going to go on forever. I mean, ask anybody who's like suffering through high school. They don't think it's ever going to end. <laughs> and, um, or any, yeah, right. exactly, yes. So it's, 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 but imagination is what um, allows us to transcend that because then you can imagine something new. You can see it, I mean, there's that saying, um, you have to see it to be it, but sometimes you can only see it in your head. But sometimes that's enough. And I think they're, they're, you know, the, the inventors and the people that we celebrate are, are the people who um, are just able to project that so strongly into the, into the world around them that they um, almost act as if that is the world around them and they can somehow take that world from their head and, and you know, make it a reality that the rest of us share. Right. Even, so, yeah. so this is how we invent the future, right? Is we right. imagine something as possible and then we pull on that thread and that. So this is the one thing that that group of disruptors um, sees and, and values that we can all see and value. So that group of disruptors that, let's say you're at Stanford Business School, so I'm just going to use an example that's close to home for me. So if you're at Stanford Business School and you have already gotten that set of credentials, um, you have a group of people, venture capitalists, listening to your pitches, et cetera, and saying, yes, you're allowed to be a disruptor. I expect you to come from here, especially if you look and feel a certain way. And what I want us to actually get is, what they have is an ecosystem that says, I expect you to have an idea. I expect you to have something to contribute, right? So we can actually recreate that for ourselves. This is where onlyness, the power of the distributed network, is so important. 
because even if the people in your old, you know, like 20 years ago, we couldn't have done this. We couldn't have stepped outside our city and our the, like, circumstance to be able to say, who else cares about the same things as this and find those people. And so when you can build either a virtual or real community, you know, like in real life community, both are real, um, uh, that's how we actually have people around us to say, yes, I see you and I believe in your ability to actually have that bold idea. And I'm getting the sign that we should go to q and Is that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's, that's the thing that we can actually take more onus of. So recognizing to, to Justine's point when she raised it earlier, power is a social construct. So if you recognize that, then you can actually build the social construct that enables you to take more risks and be bolder in what work you can do. And I just wanted to add that um, when I was reading this book, I was thinking of a phrase um, I, I picked up from another book, and I can't remember which one, but well, I'm sure it's from several, but um, you know, inner wealth as opposed to external wealth. And they, this idea of inner wealth and inner authority. And so when you look inward, um, like you know, to your imagination or to your soul or to whatever you want to call it, then you can find the authority there, the power there to, to you know, step forward and be the one who dances on the hill. Mm -hmm. But that has to, at some point, you, know, you have to turn away from all the voices um, uh, around you that are telling you, you know, you have no right to develop this idea. You have no right to be what you want to be. And, um, and, and so when you, when you reclaim yourself, then uh, you reclaim this ability to reshape the world. And I think that's why this book is incredible. And I hope everybody buys it. <laughs> so. Should we do? Uh, we have a roving mic, right? Yeah. That time when we take questions, just a quick reminder, questions around here start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They typically are short. Only Justine gets to ask follow-up questions, and we do not believe in two-part questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robin Palmer. I started on Broadway for 15 years, and I became an inventor. And as a woman with a hardware I IoT product that just had a successful Indiegogo campaign, I've been contacted by predators from, as seen on TV and other places, where they say, we love your invention. You can either license it to us, or we'll steal it from you. And we've got billions of dollars, and you're a small woman-owned com company. How do you protect yourself against that? <sighs> um, so I think um, the incubators uh, are often really great places to have uh, resources around you. So I don't know if you already belong to some kind of incubator accelerator community. And so those are the right places to turn back to and say, protect my own asset, right? Because they've actually dealt with this problem multiple times. You don't want to do it on your own. You want to build, you want to go find the community of people whose interest it is to help you be successful. Um, so I would turn back to those uh, communities because they typically have handled this problem before. Would you say that's where branding comes in? Like if you can create the story or this community around the item, so then it's no longer about the, the invention, but it's about something larger? It's about like a yeah. movement or it's about? So like Wild Fang, which is a brand focused on sort of the tomboy um, fashion segment. Um, Wild Fang, right? So the notion of um, wild one, like a you know, beast that is mm -hmm. uh, uh, out there. And um, they actually had a whole bunch of stuff stolen from them. IP, and I want to say it was like Forever 21 or whatever, tried to basically duplicate the pins, duplicate it, you know, just a whole series of things. And they did a digital outreach to their consumers, right, just on Facebook. Like, look at our stuff, which by the way has been around for years, and look at this stuff. And then they had their consumers actually send emails and, you know, do stuff to basically be like, uh 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 uh, we see you. So there's you're using your community to basically shame people into much better behavior. I'm not sure that's as possible in the space you just talked about, which is why I would turn back to community models that are there for you. Turn to community, right? So to, yeah. to, to be, I, I'm not sure it's about outspending because you really can't outspend, yeah. but you can ask people to come be with you in solidarity. And just to add, like that's the, the notion of the connected self. We were talking about this earlier, where um, when, you, when you claim your onlyness, you are also like uh, uh, connecting to other people through your onlyness. The onlyness becomes this link to other people who believe what you do and who right. are willing to support you. Rooted in your meaning, you end up finding other people who care about the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, hi, Nellifer. My name's Cooper Bates. Um, my question is, it's, uh, how do you, I think it's interesting. You have an idea, right? You have a lot of ideas, and you talk about ideas that come from other people. but. I think that we're taking for granted that uh, there's an intellect that's tied to each and every idea. So you just can't have an idea and not be able to develop it if you can't process properly. So can you talk about that? Because people, I, I don't hear that kind of follow-up. 
You mean, are you owning the execution of the idea? Is that the question? Yes, and being able to like think about, like you had this idea for onlyness. Well, most, a lot of people would have just like, yeah, that's, I have this idea for onlyness and it stays right there. But there's somehow you have this ability to process and process and process and build it into something. And I think that's really interesting. And I think that, it, well, I just think that people take for granted idea and not being able to process. And I was just wondering if you could just speak. Yeah, on that let's explore bit. that for a second. So um, it's a really important point that I probably take too much for granted in my own light bulb over the head, right? So um, because I'd worked in operations for a bunch of years and actually have shipped a whole bunch of products, like over 100 at some point, I went and figured out. Um, I, the, I don't, I'm not talking about invention. I'm not talking about creativity, right? I'm talking about how ideas make a dent in the world, which is entirely about the action necessary to go move it downfield. Action despite any knowledge that you will make it downfield. Um, and so that, that I'm assuming, and I, and I shouldn't, so I really appreciate, Cooper, that you asked that question, because until you act, nothing actually changes, mm. right? And, and I, in the, even in the process of writing this book, I asked to stop, I don't know how many times. I asked my husband how many times, like, can I please stop? This book is nearly gonna kill me. Um, because in fact, I thought, that I might research 30 or 40 stories to get to the 20 I would pick. And then it turns out as I was interviewing people, because I'm really strong in qualitative research, I was noticing that none of the patterns held. Like what people thought they were doing right wasn't the truth. And so no patterns, so each person was like, I thought I did this right. And then this other person thought I did. And I'm like, no, oh my god, there's no consistent pattern. That means they don't know. So they're all pioneers. They don't actually know, which means I'm going to have to spend time talking to a lot more people to figure out what the hell they did do right when I could spot the pattern and then decode that and find the social science behind it. So it was a really long and complicated, like way too long, way too complicated process um, and, and extremely difficult for me because I had expected it to be a year to two years. It went to almost four. Um, I then really wanted to tell stories, which I had never done before in my career. Mm -hmm. Uh, and writing stories is its own. Justine's actually quite good at storytelling. I, I would never have said I was good at it, and at one point I had finished a 120,000 word manuscript, so it is sort of done, and, uh, and I looked at it and thought, there's no, there's no heart, there's no stories. Like, it didn't pull me in, and I completely started from scratch. I threw the entire first manuscript away, um, which was devastating to me, like I was like, what crazy person am I? And also, like, I really did turn to my husband in tears and say, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do this anymore. And he actually said I would be such a bear to live with that I had to finish that, uh, <laughs> you know, in his mind, this was the idea I was born to, to do and stuff. And, um, and then he said, the only way you will ever know whether or not this idea, and because also the other part is, hmm. will this idea be accepted? Will it be, you know, will it get reviewed? Will it get all this other stuff, right? So I can go own the outcome of that also, and be like, oh, it's never gonna get, it's going so against the status quo, blah, blah, blah. What is the point, right, of all this pain? And he was like, because it's something you believe in. So it's an interesting thing to have then found 300 stories and mm. written the 20 of people who basically, in spite of any knowledge that any of that stuff was gonna work out, uh, pulled on that little thread, and instead of the world unraveling, they found themselves even more deeply connected to the world. So action, everything. You keep mentioning the thread, and it makes me think of the, um, the, the myth about the minotaur and the maze, and uh, 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 the guy who gets the girl to give him the rope that he can like, use to pull him like, out of um, this, this labyrinth of, of dead ends and confusing turns and, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's like. You're not using that context exactly, but it's, it's, it, it brings home the fact that um, we need help, that even in our onlyness, um, our onlyness is connected to, uh, to other people and to the culture at large. We celebrate individualism a great deal in American yeah. culture, um, but the word individual is the smallest measure of the human race. It is always the connected you. And we do this thing in American media, an American story that isolates the individual it is not actually, by the way, how any of us get shit done, and it's telling only one angle of a much larger truth, which is we live in a connected world, and all of our ideas are made better by the people we work with, all the work is made better by other people making it into reality, and the way in which we actually get our power and our ideas is entirely about that social construct. So we, uh, I think America sort of distorts this 
this notion of individual you. Mm -hmm. And if we take you and make it the plural you, mm -hmm. that's actually more indicative of how we get things done. It's interesting that the English language doesn't really recognize the difference between you know, the singular you and the plural you the way other, other languages do. It's true. Yeah. I was Nil learning, Nilfer, yeah. would you comment on um, the distinctions between identity and brand? I think um, for innovators and, and people who are, are trying to build a product or a company, they're pushed to have both. And sometimes those two are get confused. Right. Uh, uh, would you sort of talk about that? Yeah, this is a really important distinction. So brand, obviously, um, your brand can entirely reflect the product, all of the product. It can also be the packaging of the product, right? So um, I, all of us have probably gotten Christmas presents where there's this tiny little thing inside a huge box and a big bow and, and been like thinking it's like a big thing. And we get inside, it's this tiny little thing. It doesn't reflect the interior. It's a gift card from Starbucks. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And we're thinking, you know, it's a jewelry box or whatever, right? So, uh, uh, so packaging can be a reflection of what's in the interior, or it can be a deception of what's in the interior. And I'm much more interested, because this is about the power of ability to get something done, about what is in the package. And I'm less worried about the packaging of that. That's the distinction I would make. So brand is the exterior view. Identity, as we hold ourselves in the world, is the, the product part. The gift. The gift. Yeah. yeah, the gift. And by the way, that gift is not perfect. So we can be broken in a thousand ways. Um, a function of our history and experience is not to say our experience has to be perfect. Um, I had a banker recently tell me, um, that they had an idea for a product line for what could be what that bank could serve, but they couldn't bring it up at a meeting. And I was like, really, why? I'm, I'm surprised you seem to really have a good relationship with your colleagues. And, uh, and they said, well, the reason I really understand this need is because I was raised extremely poor. And so our family lost quite a bit of money that we earned because we had to go to check cashing places that essentially gouged you. And I have an idea for how to do that in a much more economical way and really be in much more service to that community. But I don't, no one here that I work with knows that I grew up poor. And they're all extremely wealthy when they grew up. And I don't want to reveal that to them. So she viewed a part of herself you know, through the shadow, right? She was basically saying, this is not legitimate because this group of people is so different. And that is good. Instead of what was her real life experience, instead of celebrating that. So when I say onlyness is a function of your history and experience, visions and hopes, it is all of you, even if bad things have happened to you, even if you've been a function of you know, circumstances that are not the storybook circumstance, that too is a strength, right? So owning so all of that. Often you develop strategies to, uh, to get through those obstacles and to, to deal with that kind of trauma. And you can take those strategies and you apply them to other areas of your life, and sometimes that strategy is actually the gift. So the gift. I've always been intrigued by that connection between you know, the gift and um, the wound. Yes, so. yes, it's a beautiful language. Hi, Nilifer. Hi, Justine. Um, I just wanted to let you know that this book, I just, I just like, I don't know, I just, I feel like it's probably one of the most powerful things I've read, um, and something that I wish I'd had when I was a student in college, trying mm. to find her way. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just really glad that I just like read this book because um, I can just see it playing a very pivotal role in just how I live my life and try to be of service to the rest of the world um, for the rest of my life. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and so one question that I have is, um, you know, like, do you have any tips or insights in terms of how we can, you know, rethink this process of just, you know, like having a hard time articulating this, but I just, I feel like I just have an individual story that I feel like can really potentially make a big difference in this world, but I'm having a hard time converting that to, you know, the collective group's experience and story if that makes any sense. It's like, I know what I believe, um, but I don't know how this could relate to other people and what the promised land could be. Okay. Thank you. Um, by the way, thank you for the compliment. That's really nice of you. And then um, I think the thing you're saying is, what, what thing do I want to work on? 
you can quite say it that way, but I'm going to take you that way, and then you help me see if that helps. So we can care about a great deal of things. Like, um, you know, I can care about um, criminal incarceration issues. Uh, I can therefore care about who ha who's running the local DA's office. I can care about data systems and how the internet is more open to all. And I also know strategy really well. Like I can know all those three things at the same time. And then I have to sit there and go, okay, where do I want to invest my time to make a difference in the world? What's the dent I want to make? And pick that thing that is your highest best use. Um, and, and even if you don't know how to make money at it and stuff, what is the, what is the one thing that, you know, if, if um, if tomorrow, you know, I got a death sentence and I was going to get cancer in three years and I was going to die and I knew that, now what was I going to spend the next three years on? And what's that one thing I could really make a difference on? And there's two ways most people go. We usually do the, there's so many things I can't pick. And then I get this a lot, which I, I'm always surprised by, but I, I hear it, which is, I don't, I don't feel anything. That doesn't seem to be you. Your problem isn't that you don't feel anything. You actually seem to have like, you know, passion in there. So the thing is, where would you most want to apply your energy? So just, you know, if you pick up the paper tomorrow and you go, what are the stories mm. I'm super drawn to and think that's a problem? What would you do to go fix that problem? And, and to aim towards a specific thing will help direct your meaning into the world. So um, you read the story of Kim where I told five stories and I said, these are five stories of Kimberly's life and this is the meaning she's drawn from it. Um, the point is I could have done that with anyone and drawn a, a through line for any of the stories, and, but how she chooses to apply that meaning was the internal choice and decision she, only she could make. Does that help? Yeah? You're thinking. Okay, keep thinking. So we have time for a couple more questions. No? Oh. <laughs> and, uh, so here, let me ask you something, yes. uh, Nilofer. Um, so you wake up in the morning. What are like the first few things you grasp for um, to sort of kindle that idea generation process? Is it a newspaper? Is it the news? Is it meditation? What is it? Yeah, I'm not a meditator. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can probably figure that out right away. Uh, uh, the, uh, I wish I was, but I'm not. Uh, I am a really big news junkie. Uh, at Twitter, back in the early days, I was one of those people that, it was a lot more fun before November 9th uh, to read Twitter, but, uh, but I would be, you know, in 15, 20 minutes, like really feeling caught up in the world and uh, digest news and then moving on into email and then moving, you know, so I, a really fast reader, fast digester of information. And then I usually have one or two projects on my plate at all times uh, that, that, that are just like, this is it, this is the ball I have to move for the next year. And I usually have one thing already identified the day before that I need to do that day. And I just charge into that. Um, I like getting kind of like orientation about what's going on with the world, because almost always I have some inspiration from that, some little nugget. Um, and then I, I figure out how to apply that. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of, my husband sort of like, aren't you, the, you know, don't you wish you were like a quiet journaling person? I'm like, yeah, I'm not that person. <laughs> and our final question for the morning. Can you speak to the special challenges of introverts in, in a space of loneliness? Right, so um, in fact, uh, you know, loneliness got compared to Susan Cain's work who wrote Quiet, uh, 800 CEO Read, which is, a, which is an organization that does reviews mostly for the business world, um, compared it to two other books. So it's interesting that Daniel Goleman's coming into town, Ted. Um, so it compared to Daniel Goleman and said, you know, before his work, we used to think of intelligence only as that intellectual IP stuff instead of e, um, emotional intelligence. So that expanded the universe of what we did. Susan's work really expanded to understand that the quietest person in the room might be the best problem solver and maybe we could tap into that. And, um, and, then, and then onlyness is making an argument that every single one of us has the ability to create value. So we're just expanding how we view who has the capacity to contribute in each of these apertures. Um, so going back to the introvert piece and onlyness, um, I think the, the big piece is how do you figure out um, how to draw energy? So this morning, a girlfriend who is a former Startup America executive and stuff wrote and said, I can't decide if I need to spend more time with my tribe or less time with my tribe because her parents are uh, just passed away and she's dealing with a lot of life transition right now. And I actually wrote it right back. It's funny you asked that question. 
uh, I wrote her back and I said, do you remember if you're an introvert or an extrovert or an ambivert? Because under stress, which is what's actually mm -hmm. going on for her, you need to make sure you fill up the bank again. If you never fill up that bank again, you can't have ideas, you can't act on those ideas. So remember which one you are, just triage back to that and make sure you're doing that. So if you are an extrovert and you're exhausted, then go be with people because that will renew you. If you're an introvert and you're exhausted, sink deeper into yourself and figure out how to be in that quiet reserve to fill your own bank. None of us can actually create work in the world if we haven't filled up that bank, right? So I think the big question is just knowing your own style and knowing how to navigate your energy flow around that. I'm an ambivert, so I really prefer quiet most of the time. And then, as you can tell, I show up in the world mm -hmm. and, uh, and try to share the things that I'm working on. But if I don't balance that two things, like if I was on the road all the time right now, I would lose my mind, right? So that incredibly quiet space is my way of kind of pulling back in. And so you can't draw mm -hmm. your own capacity to contribute if you have nothing in that bank. So that's how I think about that question. Helpful? Cool. All right. Great. Thanks a lot, Nilifer. Thank, Thank you, Justine. Thank you all for being here this morning.